Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle, and I will be moderating today's panel for the Government of Alberta's Brain Injury Initiative. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's ABII webcast. It's part of a monthly series of webcasts on issues relating to brain injury. This webcast is part of the Alberta Brain Injury Initiative's strategy to provide accessible information covering a broad range of topics that are accessible to all Albertans. For more information about this series, check your emails for our regular updates, or you can go to hslearningseries.ca, or you can also follow us on Twitter at AB Human Services. We have an exciting discussion lined up today where we hope to address some of the major questions we have heard over the last year around the caregivers who commit their time and energy to care for loved ones with brain injuries. To help us dive into these topics, we've brought in panelists representing those caregivers, as well as a representative from an agency who works with those caregivers on a day-to-day -day basis. With the help of our panelists, we are going to take time to explore topics like what being a caregiver has meant to them and how they manage the demands caregiving has on their day-to-day -day lives. As always, you'll be able to pose your questions to our panelists via our live chat, which is just below your video window. We will address as many of these questions as we can during the question and answer period at the end of the panel. So let's start off today's session with some introductions. Teresa LaRock Walker works for Edmonton's Brain Care Center. She is a counselor and support facilitator. She is certified with the Canadian Counseling and Psychotherapy Association. Ellie York is a caterer living in Edmonton. She has been a caregiver, caregiver for two individuals with brain injuries for nine years. Joe Spencer is an industrial radiographer and has been married for 28 years. His wife had a brain aneurysm in 2012. And Glenna Lesko works for a towing company in Edmonton and has been a longtime caregiver. And Paige is our online moderator. She'll pose your web chat questions to our guests. Today's session is also being recorded and the video will be posted on the Alberta FASD webpage after the live recording. So let us begin. First of all, I just want to welcome you all to the panel today. I want to start off with uh, Teresa LaRock Walker. Welcome today. Just tell me a little bit about your background, Teresa. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, my background is working with Brain Care Centre for the last seven and a half years. I work there as a counsellor and support facilitator. Uh, we work with individuals with an acquired brain injury who are 18 years or over. Um, I work with individuals with injury, but I also work a lot with caregivers and I run support, a support group for them and I also do individual counseling. Caregivers are under a lot of stress. They deal with a wide array of issues and they often have little support. The caregivers who access counseling or attend the group are looking for some education, they're looking for support, but I think more importantly, they're looking for a safe place where they can share the challenging experiences they are facing um, and feel very accepted and um, not, I was gonna say not judged. They just are accepted as who they are and, and as I said, it's just a safe place for them to share. Just how important is it for them to share? I think it's really, really essential for well-being. The stress they're under is quite enormous and it's, it's ongoing. As you've heard, many of them have been doing this for a long time. And in order to, I think, address the difficult emotions they're facing, it's, it's helpful to be able to talk to other people, to find out that you're not the only one, that you're not alone in your journey and that other people are experiencing very often the very similar emotions that they're dealing, that you're dealing with. Ellie, you're a caregiver. Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I have two kids, I have two animals, and I have two grandchildren. And um, I cater for a living, although I'm semi-retired now. Um, I love people, I like to see what's going on with them, and uh, I'm lucky to be involved with brain care, caregivers, it's of paramount importance to me. Tell me about your day. What's an average day for you as a caregiver? 
Well, you do a lot of listening. You do a minimal amount of talking because nobody understands what you say. You do a lot of laundry. You do a lot of cleaning. And there's a lot of pressure and tension in my house. What has changed in your life as a caregiver? Well, my uh, social life has um, been affected. I can't go out as often as I'd like. There's always an issue at home. Um, I don't work as much. I don't work out as much because I need to be at home. I have a person that um, has um, several issues with cancer recently, and uh, he needs special care. And uh, so I'm at home. Joe, how about yeah. your experience? Tell us a little bit about where you're coming from and your story. In my story. Well, like I said, I've been married for 28 years. I got four daughters and six grandchildren, who I enjoy a lot. Um, getting used to Barbara as after her aneurysm is it's, it's a hard thing. It's, it's really hard because her memory loss is. It's big. It's, she doesn't remember a lot of stuff. Her anger, you know. And um, my day that my day starts about 4:30 in the morning, 5:30 in the morning. I get up to go to work, make sure that she's okay. Then I I go to work and 11 o'clock between 11 and 12 every day hasn't changed for four years. That she'll phone and ask me what she should cook for supper because she can't make decisions on her own anymore. And if I don't answer her or tell her I don't know, well, I'll come home to maybe nothing, <laughs> which is understandable because she just, she, she can't make decisions anymore. Yeah, and um, when I get home at night, she'll have the supper, we'll have supper, we'll watch a bit of TV, and she'll tell me about what happened in her day or when she, she goes to art every Wednesday for brain care people, she goes to art, and she'll tell me about her art class, and she'll repeat herself Every half hour, she'll tell me the same thing. She repeats herself a lot. And I just let her go on about I don't correct her. I just let her repeat. I don't want to make her feel bad. And then around 6.30, she's in bed. And that's every night, seven days a week, she's in bed at 6.30, 7 o'clock. And I'm up doing whatever till 11 o'clock, whatever, on my own, which is kind of lonely and hard. Yeah. And what about your love for sports? Oh, yeah. I, I'm allowed to watch my hockey. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one thing that she, it's okay for me to go to a football game here or get to watch the hockey on TV, which will have her separate TVs because she doesn't like sports at all. So that's how I spend most of my time is watching hockey or football or whatever alone in the house because she's in bed at 6.30, 7 o'clock, like I said, every single night. It's been like that for four years. So you get kind of lonely, you know, when you're up there by yourself. Then I go to bed and I start all over the next day. In the same routine, up at 4.35, off to work. Kind of decide, sometimes I'll take out from the freezer what I want for supper, but she'll still phone ask me, how do you want me to cook it? And just, it's, it's a daily thing. It's been going, like I said, for four or five years, that's what I've been going through. Yeah. Glenna, we're gonna move on to you. We'll talk a little bit more about that, yeah. Joe, in a minute. Yeah. But um, Glenna, tell us a little bit about you. Give um, us your story. Well, I'm a single mom of two, um, both with brain injuries, one developmental and one acquired. Uh, they found two brain tumors when he was almost 13. Um, I work full time and uh, have many interests that I don't seem to find the time to get to and would like to. What is your average day like? Uh, I'm up between 4 and 4.30 in the morning uh, out of the house after I uh, make sure that he's taken his meds. Um, we've had a non-compliance with meds recently, so we I try to watch as much as possible for him to take his meds before while I'm at home. Um, I'm out of the house around 6 and home between 5 and 6 at night. Uh, he video uh, texts me him taking his meds at noon or whenever he wakes up uh, and I mean you know beyond the responsibilities at work my mind is worried about what's going on at home and with him. 
how has your life changed since becoming a caregiver? Uh, in my case, it really hasn't. Um, he was, like I said, he was almost 13 when they found the, found the tumors. Um, and basically, I'm still mom. That's my role has never really changed um, in, in that case. And he's 34 now, and I certainly wasn't expecting at this point in time in my life to still be a full-time mom. Um, so he's, maturity-wise, he's probably, or at least every three months or so, the 12-year-old comes out. You know, so I'm basically dealing with 12-year-old issues um, with him and how he perceives things. Why not, so. Yeah, you all have difficult stories to share, and we really appreciate you coming today. Ellie, let's talk a little bit about um, specifically what it means to be a caregiver. So what, how would you describe that role? Well, I really don't know where to start. There's a lot of, um, a lot of issues. You um, can't have a conversation. I love conversation. I love talking. You can't do that. They don't understand. They don't grasp what you're saying to them. It's, um, they repeat and repeat and repeat. So it's so, it's very difficult. It's really difficult in that aspect. Um, I'm limited as to what to do. I can't go out a lot, as I said prior, because um, I don't trust them at home. They can't cook by themselves because you can't trust them. Uh, I have one, um, the girl that I'm looking after, she has a mentality of a 12-year-old as well. And um, she's extremely difficult, very stubborn. So you've got to learn how to get around that. You've got to learn how to talk on a grade one level without, you know, hurting their feelings. So I've learned to do that. I've learned a lot of patience absolutely a lot of patience so you know there are good things about it um, I love my people don't get me wrong I love my people and I would never send them away and I wouldn't leave but it's a difficult choice so that one challenge you talk about specifically <coughs> talking to them at their level but not trying to insult them or intimidate it. how did how did you manage to find I a, a solution to do that. I learned to do that and how do you do it? I don't exactly know what how to um, explain that. It just it's a very basic type of conversation that you have to uh, choose to do. It's very basic. It's like talking to a child, and then they don't understand. They don't get it. You know, that's the sad part. Joe. What do you define as a caregiver? How would you explain that? Well, same as sure. The, um, well, as far as I'm concerned, the caregiver thing starts as, my caregiving started since my wife went into the hospital. I went there, I spent every single day of three months, I think, every day in the hospital, feeding her, helping her get dressed, because she had to learn everything all over, how to get dressed, how to eat, how to walk, she had to learn everything. And I find that if you're there helping them every day, they'll, they'll get better faster, just through your love and, and support. But patience is a thing that you need to have, or I needed to have. Before this happened, my wife had patience like you wouldn't believe, and I'm the one that short fuse, so to speak. Now it's completely changed. I've got all the patience, and she has not much not much patience at all. So helping them that way, and you also, I find the caregiver, we gotta have thick skin because things that they say sometimes, you know they don't mean it, but it still hurts when they say it. It really, it still hurts. Yeah, so caregiver, you have to be patient, like really patient. You gotta take what they say and kinda get over it. And also, you gotta involve your kids as caregiver because your kids gotta know what's going on with their mother. So they'll understand when they see her, because our, our girls are all over, and they don't see her often. So I kind of keep them in touch, up to date with what's going on with, our, with their mom. So when, when they do see her, talk to her on the phone, they'll understand not to get so upset about what she, about what she says, because sometimes she doesn't really understand what she's saying herself. 
How about for you, Glenna? How would you define a caregiver? Um, I guess, well, I think for everybody, for all of us, but for myself, I, you're their advocate. You're their voice. Um, you know, whether it's through medical, whether it's through uh, governments, you know, dealing with the government, dealing with mental health, um, dealing with family, friends, you, you really are their voice. Tracy, you're coming at it from a different point of view because you work with a lot of caregivers. How do you see it? Well, I think a caregiver, and, and we're talking about familial or personal caregivers here, um, is anyone who takes on the care of another person. Um, in this case, it's, it is ongoing. It's, it's a long, long, long lasting route. The caregiver often really um, supersedes all their own needs um, in order that their loved one has what they need. And that puts, that puts them at a bit of risk, a bit of risk for physical health issues. Um, and as Glenna said, a caregiver really is an advocate. That person, sometimes it's decision making and sometimes it's just fighting so that their loved one gets the things that they need. Um, their loved one really oftentimes um, doesn't have the capacity anymore to speak for themselves and to ask for themselves. And so it's up to the caregiver to fulfill that role. I'm going to shift the focus a little bit now on to the caregiver themselves. And what do you, Teresa, think um, are the challenges that you see the caregivers themselves personally facing? You know, I think <clears throat> I think one of the biggest ones is that of social isolation. Most of my caregivers talk about the fact that that they're there with their loved one um, and many of their family and friends move on in their lives. And so there's a radical change from maybe having a very social active life prior to brain injury um, and suddenly being more isolated. Sometimes they're dealing with depression or anxiety um, and they self-isolate and that's when I really encourage them to come for counseling or come to the group. They're dealing with such, such long-lasting um, and constant pressure and stress. And we know that stress is very unhealthy for the body. So for them, it's trying to identify what are those stressors, um, and they're not going away. So how do I deal with them in a more, in a more healthy and um, adaptive way? Every group, it seems, I hear someone, someone saying, you know, I feel like I don't belong here. I feel like I don't, um, I don't have enough problems to be here. Um, but also, I feel alone. I feel like I'm the only one. Uh, nobody gets it. My good friends don't get it. My family don't get it. So for them, it's, it's coming away from that isolation and reaching out for support for themselves. They need to be strong for their loved ones. Um, but they also just have a right. Um, to have a life themselves. So how do you support them? Well, um, at Brain Care Centre we offer individual counselling, uh, which when people are in very much in crisis, I, I often recommend that they do some individual counselling first to just work through whatever the issue at hand is. The support group is an open-ended group so they can come and stay as long as they like. Um, it's held every two weeks. Some people come for a couple of months and don't come back. Some people come for years and drop out for a while and come back. And a lot of it's, again, it's some education about this is what a brain injury is. These are some strategies. Um, these are some difficult behaviors you might be facing. Here are some ways to deal with those behaviors. I, I have one gal and, and she's been coming for a long time and she keeps asking like why is he so angry and it's his brain injury and she just has such a hard time because she's dealing with it all the time. So sometimes it's just I feel a bit like a broken wheel because I'm saying sometimes the same things but, but getting them to understand that with a brain injury it's very unique to that individual um, kind of 
where the injury happens, how it, you know, how, how deep or how widespread the problem depends on what, what changes you're going to see. There's very often a complete um, change in personality. You know, jo Joe talked about his wife having such infinite patience and now not at all. And so caregivers are either the parents of or married to or the siblings of people that they might not even really know anymore. They're so radically changed. And some caregivers choose to leave um, for their own well-being and health. They, they feel that that's the best option. And, and sometimes that is the best option. The caregivers who attend my group very often are choosing to stay and they're trying to figure out how do I, how do I stay, how do I take the best care of my loved one, how do I keep my own sanity? And my role is to help them figure out some of those questions. So Joe, a little follow up to what you were saying, you talked about feeling lonely, mm -hmm. isolated. What are some of the challenges, just a little bit in more deeper context, that you're facing in now and then what you foresee in the future? Well, going out with, with Barb when we do go out, I got to be careful what she says because sometimes like she'll say things that are uh, hurtful to certain people not knowing she's doing it. So I got to kind of sidetrack the conversation sometimes just to kind of hopefully she doesn't say the wrong thing to the wrong person. Um, when we're at home and if it gets a little bit heated, so to speak, I have a route that I walk at home. It's about an hour and it does me a lot of good. I'll go out and walk and I admit I talk to myself, you know, start to sort things out and realize that, okay, well, she didn't really mean this and, you know, just things like that. When I get home it's, and she'll only remember that we argued, you know, it's, it's difficult. Uh, like I said, you got to have thick skin because the things that comes out of my wife's mouth is sometimes it's, it's hurtful. It's really hurtful. And sometimes you're thinking, is it, like she said, is it worth it? To, and it is worth it for me because I've known my wife since we were in grade three, for God's sakes. We've been married 28 years. We've got four girls, grandchildren. So it, it's worth the, the fight. But sometimes it, it's difficult. It's really hard. And as I said before with the girls, Keep them involved because a couple of times well, my oldest daughter has said to me, if you want to leave mom, we all understand because it's not fair what you're going through. And we can't help because they're living elsewhere. And I said, no, no, I'm never going to leave your mother. They said, but if you decided to leave your mother, we would understand. And I would never, never leave my wife. Like I said, I've known her since grade three, married 28 years. We've got a lot of history, so to speak. And sometimes it's rough, but it, it's, it's well worth it. It's well worth the fight for my, to keep my wife happy. And besides that, taking her to the movies is about the only thing we do. Like she, Teresa said, my social life is absolutely zero because she cannot handle, she can't handle noise, a lot of noise. She can't handle a lot of people. She gets really stressed out. And once she gets stressed, then her mind just goes I don't know the word to use, mushy. Like she needs to go to bed and start all over the next day. Because the amount of people, like going to West Edmonton Mall, she can't do that anymore. Well, it's a good thing for me, but she can't go there anymore because there's just too many people. And she gets all mixed up. If we go somewhere, I have to stay by her side because if I go down, let's say shopping, go down the other aisle, she gets worried because she won't be able to find me. Because her, her sense of direction also is non-existent. So. It's rough, but as I say, it's worth going to the group and understanding what I'm going through because of the people in the group, and it helps a lot. It helps a lot because there was one incident where I exploded at her for the first time in four and a half years. I let go, and I felt so bad, but then I found out at group that they've all been through it, but you still feel bad because you know it's not really them. I mean, it is them, but it's not really, it wasn't them before. And it's like I'm married to a completely different woman. I was going to say, it's not the person you No, it's not the person I'm married before. at all. It's completely. And the, and the girls say the same thing, it's not their mother. Because one of my daughters said to her fiancé, said, I only wish she had a no mom, mom before she had her in the rhythm. So it's not only hard on me, it's hard on the girls too. And the grandkids. Yeah. 
How about you, Glenna? What are the challenges that you specifically face? Um, isolation, social isolate, isolation. I used to have a open door policy at my at my house, and anybody was welcome to walk in the door. Uh, I now cringe when everybody's home and some the door is opening or somebody's knocking at it or the phone rings. Um, thank God for Facebook because it's a silent way of being able to keep in contact with people in my life and knowing what's going on with them even if it's just simply liking their post. So that, I mean, I'm there but not there. Um, Does it allow you to participate in some fashion? It, it does. Uh, is it enough? No. Um, I mean, that that's... As you... I mean, not only... There's only one of me. And everybody has a need. Everybody has an expectation. Um, you know, my son expects me to be there for him. My other son expects me to be there for him, my boyfriend. Basically, you end up just really sucking at everything in your life. Um, I don't think that's true. I think that's maybe how you feel. <laughs> okay, but I, I feel like I suck at everything <laughs> in my life and wish that I had about two more of me and then we'd be really rocking. Um, that sounds like you're doing things great if we need two more of you. You're no, just not giving we yourself need enough. two more of me because <laughs> I'm not doing great. Uh, you know, it, it's it's hard. You know, um, I mean, my son doesn't have a lot of physical things needs, um, but you know, my mother's aging; she's got physical needs. And I think one of the hardest challenges is now that I'm starting to have medical needs, and it's like, wait a minute, I don't look after me. Um, so dealing with the anger and slightly rebellion. Um, <coughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm probably the worst patient ever. Uh, you know, so it, it's just, and time and balance, that elusive balance. And losing yourself, that's huge. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to take care of yourself, how you guys are doing that, you know, trying to do that and what you can do in just a moment. But I just want to touch base with Allie and find out um, what are the specific challenges you face. I have um, an issue with chronic pain. And uh, so now I'm not only physically burnt out, I'm mentally burnt out. And uh, it seems to be getting worse every day. Uh, Jim is getting verbally abusive, and I have to learn how to deal with that. I have no idea what to do. Uh, the only um, high point in my life at this time is our, our caregivers' meetings. Teresa has been very informative. I'm lucky to be there. I'm lucky to meet, I've met these wonderful people. They have the same problems as I do. Um, how to deal with them is a good question. I don't know. Teresa, help us out. How can these people and other people who are watching today, how can they take care of themselves? And tell us why that's so important. Well, you know, as I said, the caregivers need to take care of themselves because they deserve to, you know, be in good health and have a life. Um, and also, if they're not able to take care of themselves, then they're not able to take care of their loved ones. I often in group use the airline analogy of the oxygen mask. You know, they say when it comes down, you put it on yourself first, and then you put it on your child or your elderly parent. Um, if you can't breathe, they definitely can't breathe. So sometimes caregivers perceive um, looking after themselves as being selfish and um, as putting their own needs before their loved ones, which sometimes you have to do. Um, how can they do it? Well, I think reaching out for support. So if you have a close friend you can call up and talk to, who isn't judgmental and isn't critical and just listens to you and just affirms you're doing a great job. Um, a family member. You know, sometimes family members don't get it and I recommend 
sometimes they're not going to get it. So don't take a lot of what they say as, as being, you know, at face value. Choose people who do accept you. Um, reach out if you can, you know, if you don't have someone in your personal circle or you feel like, you know, feel uncomfortable with that or you feel like maybe you're, you're going to burn them out, then reach out for, you know, for professional support. You know, throughout the province, there's, you know, the regions are all broken up and, and there is a brain injury initiative in every part of the province. So call an info line at Brain Care Centre, find out what's available in your community. Um, Alberta Caregivers also runs groups called Compass, which, um, which is an, a group that's run, I think it's about a 10 week class that people can take. It's not specifically for brain injury, but it is for caregiving. The Glen Rose runs Caregiver College um, twice a year. It's a six week session. Um, you can just call the Glen Rose and find out about it. Our, our group, we're very, very fortunate to have had it running for as long as we have and to have it ongoing um, because I think there is a lot of support. Um, Joe talked about going for a walk mm -hmm. and, that, and that, yeah, he walks for an hour, talks to himself and basically can, can kind of sort out and, and kind of, oops, <laughs> parse apart what, what is his wife and what is her brain injury and so doesn't take as much offense. Um, Glenna didn't mention it, but a few years ago she was giving a, given a camera for Christmas and she blossomed because she started taking time just for herself to go and take photographs and um, and, and, and I think that's what she needed. And I think when you focus on something that you love doing, you kind of are able to clear your mind of what you're doing on a daily basis. Um, for Ellie, she showed us, you know, she has beautiful nails today. She does some self-care. You can do self-care at home. You can get out in the community and do it. You can join a group, you know, not only this group. Um, the group members here, Joe mentioned he and his wife used to always go to uh, dinner theaters and he loved it and his wife Barbara can't do it anymore like noise lights people uh, and he was talking about it and a couple of the women said well, I'd love to go to a dinner theater and they have no one to go with and I said why don't you guys do that why don't you just set it up and why don't you go do it and so they have they've picked a date they've gotten Ellie's been great and gotten tickets for people um, and you know what, it's just a chance for them to kick back and to be themselves. We have a dinner every quarter, so we have meetings every other week. And once a quarter, we just go out to a Boston pizza and, and they again just get to be themselves. And I think they need that. And it's a very safe place because the, you know, if, if something is hard for them that week, they talk about it a little bit. But inevitably, the, end, the evening ends up in lots of giggles, people sharing desserts, it's lots of fun. How important is it to talk about anything but caregiving? I think it's really important because I think your focus, a caregiver's focus is really on caregiving and on that role. And like Lana says, I, I'm just not doing it. I'm not doing a good enough job. Well, yes, you are because you're doing the best that you can and that's all anyone can ask. But no, to, to, to have other interests is to kind of fill, I, I guess I think of that empty vessel. And as a caregiver, you're constantly pouring out of yourself for your loved one. And when you pick, get those other inside, outside interests, be it friends, be it a, a hobby, be it a sports game, be it a walk in nature, you're kind of pouring back into that vessel and you're filling your well so that you can continue to keep going. It's so absolutely Ellie, vital. Ellie, we were talking about um, you know, self-care and obviously you take very good care of yourself because you look great. How does that make you feel when you get that opportunity to do your nails or your makeup or you know, go out shopping for yourself? I love it. Yeah, it makes me feel really good. It does. I also do a lot of crossword puzzles. How does that help? It's uh, very relaxing and it's challenging too. I have to have my phone with me the whole time. I do them in the sun, in the journal, and 
you know, I do the more difficult ones, so you got to keep your mental mental thing going. Otherwise, you know, because I'm alone so often. Because Jim, he watches TV in his bedroom, so I'm alone. So that's what I do. Is that some sort of escape for you a little bit? Oh, definitely it is. I also go to church on Sunday. I have a lot of friends there, and we, we have a great time. A little bit of flirting and a little bit of giggling, and yeah, it's fun. Just living life. Mm-hmm, exactly. And how about for you, Joe? You talked about the importance of getting out and walking mm -hmm. and, and talking to yourself, but you're just mainly wanting to get it off your chest is what I'm hearing, right? What other kind of things could you be doing that you'd, you'd like to do? Good question. Uh, I'd like to be able to go visit my kids more often, you know, but being there in Nova Scotia and Ottawa doesn't happen very often. That would help a lot. Um, being around Edmonton, like I said before, I'll go to football games. She doesn't mind me going to the football games as long as I'm not six, seven hours, because uh, she doesn't like being alone for that long amount of time, and I don't want to leave her alone that amount of time, because you never know what's going to happen. But basically, that's that's my life. Is I'll go to football games in the summer, go to the festivals, which I enjoy. But now I'm going alone because she cannot, uh, she can't handle them. But I'll still go. Last year, I started volunteering at Heritage Days here. And it's a three-day festival thing, and I volunteered there, which I really enjoyed. Um, basically, that's about all I do for myself, because she doesn't really like to do much, and I don't want to leave her alone either. It's not good for her to leave her alone. So I get what I can, and I take the hours I can get and enjoy it, and then I'm back home with her. What kind of options are there available for you to um, have her in someone else's care? Well, you maybe do something for a little longer, mm -hmm. or perhaps go to visit your children. Well, here's an example. We went to Nova Scotia last summer, and she wanted to stay to help out my daughter. So I said, okay, you can stay, and which was a good thing that we were all happy, but as soon as I got home, she called me once. She wanted to go home. She didn't want to be there. She, she needed me. Uh, she wanted to get on the plane to come home right away, actually, and I said, no, you've got to stay for a little bit. And she had a hard time with that, like a real hard time. So really, there's no one I can really... Well, we have a daughter here now, and she'll go visit her once in a while. I'll drive her there. But she doesn't want anybody. She just wants to... It's me. She says, you're my right-hand person. You're, you're my soul, so I need you, nobody else. I mean, it's nice to hear, but it's hard sometimes that you can't get out a little bit more often with her or on my own. So I get about three, four hours. I'll, like I said, I'll go to a football game and I'll always enjoy it. But then I'm back home and watching TV or whatever. Once in a while we'll go to a movie, but not often. Teresa, do you find that with um, uh, people who are suffering from brain injuries that they develop a level of trust with a certain person or a certain group of people and need to always be with them? Um, very much so. The amount of loss experienced by a person with brain injury, very often loss of employment, loss of um, autonomy, being able to drive, um, just not even understanding, dependent on the level of injury. Um, the people I work with have more moderate to severe injuries. So they don't understand, and I mean, if you're frustrated and you don't understand things, you tend to act out, you tend to have some different behaviors, and generally, the only people you really feel safe with are people who are very, very close to you and who treat you really well. And so I find very often caregivers have their loved ones are very deeply connected to them, and that's the only person they trust. So then a caregiver feels guilty if they want or need time away um, because they know that their loved one's going to find it difficult. Sometimes if you can access respite care, which I don't think there's very much of in our province, um, sometimes that's just the only option because sometimes a caregiver needs a break. But very often there is that level of guilt. Um, and the individual with injury is, many times they seem almost, well, they seem reduced to a childlike status, uh, especially with a frontal lobe injury, which happens at the front part of the brain. Um, 
their ability, decision making, understanding, empathy, just so many functions that make us human beings. If that is impaired or, or extremely damaged, then, then you're looking at someone who's much more childlike and, and sometimes just, you know, even maybe thinking and behaving like a toddler. And if you think about children, the people they trust are their parents or their caregivers. And I think that's very often the situation we see with, with, um, with individuals with injury. Now, I don't work with people with caregivers whose loved ones have very mild injuries and are pretty independent. And I don't work with people with brain injury who have mild injuries and are, are quite independent. So the people that come to Brain Care Center very often are dealing with a, a quite a, a depth, a breadth of injury that's quite extreme. And their caregivers are dealing with that as well. Glenna, what would you like to do on your own just to try to escape? But you don't know, you talked to me before we went on the air about uh, wanting and just needing a vacation. Um, a lot of my uh, holiday time that I earn from employment is taken up to cover appointments. And I think actually it was through coming on the panel here that I realized that I have never had a vacation that I'm not looking after somebody. So that would be, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, I think the thing that I find hard though is oftentimes is how do you balance doing for yourself and it being worth the guilt that you're feeling in having that time. Um, I, I use group night. I have two hours between work, getting off work and group where I have my, it's my alone time. It's my one alone time every two weeks where it's just supposed to be about me and just relaxing and whatnot. And last group, I'm sitting at McDonald's in the parking lot and there's a homeless guy, a gentleman with a brain injury who every time the light went red was out in the traffic trying to get money. So I'm watching the light and every time it turned green I'm like get off the road, get off the road, get off the road. <laughs> I was like you just cannot stop. Like you don't even know the person but you just can't stop. But uh, balance, it's... Teresa, how do you think that um, we can help people like Glenna? Because I'm sure Glenna's not the only one who just has it always on his or her mind. Oh, definitely. I think caregivers across the board um, are really struggling and, and that guilt issue and trying to find balance. Um, I think we as a society need to be more mindful of those with brain injury. Um, we need to be more educated so that we can be more mindful. And we definitely need to be very much more supportive and mindful of caregivers. There needs to be more respite. Um, if the government can increase um, in some way the funding that they give to caregivers, you know, Glenn is saying, I'm using holiday time so that I can take my, my child to appointments. Um, Ellie's suffering, Joe's, you know, giving up. And so I think as a society, we need to be more supportive. If you know a caregiver and if there's any way you can help, that would be wonderful. You know, a phone call, um, some baking, just a listening ear. And they don't, they don't want you to fix the situation. They don't want you to find answers for them they just want you to listen and on a you know it's a systemic problem so on a higher level of government the government really needs to find ways to step up and and find support ellie do you agree with teresa absolutely i do i really do what would you like to see well the phone call would be nice somebody to that i can vent to that i can listen to People are very ignorant of brain injury and what it entails. They really are. And my closest friends are ignorant. 
um, I try to explain what's going on. Nobody understands. I want somebody to listen to me and understand. You know, they're not going to make the problems go away. I just need somebody to hear me. How about you, Joe? What do you think needs to be done? I couldn't say, really. <laughs> For me, um, I use my daughters for support. I call them when I'm having a hard time, whatever. Uh, I'll call one of them and we'll talk and they, they listen. I think having your kids involved is an important thing and it helps. It helps me a lot because like I said, I got four girls and I'll talk to each one of them at a certain point in time, all the time. If I, if I got something going on that's really upsetting me and the caregivers are grouped not till the following week, well then I call one of my girls and it helps. It helps a lot. How about for society, though? Would you like them to be more educated about oh, yeah. brain injury and yeah. how difficult it is to deal with it? Yeah. I mean, even some of the guys I work with, you know, I come home, sometimes I'm, I'll go to work frustrated because of, <clears throat> and they all know what my wife's gone through, but they don't understand one little bit of it. Because I'll say, my God, she just did this. And they say, uh, no, she didn't. That's what I'm telling you, this is what she did. She doesn't understand what she's doing. And they don't understand when I say that she has no memory, like her short term, she has nothing. They don't understand when I say, well, I told Barbara, but she's forgotten. You know, people don't understand when they have a short term memory loss, it's lost. Like Barbara repeats herself constantly in a conversation. And we had our work party and she did come and she's talking and the next time at work, one of my buddies asked me, he says, why does Barbara always talk about the same thing over and over and over. I said, I told you, she's lost her short-term memory. They didn't understand that part. So for my co-workers to understand would be great. Uh, Barbara trying to handle things on her own at the store when she's paying for groceries or whatever we're doing. Sometimes she'll forget her, her number, you know, her, her number and I'll put it in for her. And then the cashier is like looking at me like, is she a little kid or what's going on? You don't need that kind of stuff, you know. And for Barbara, well, she she has her support at her art group that she goes to, and that's a good thing because they all they're all going through the same thing as she is. And she'll tell me that she's and she'll even tell me that some of these people repeat themselves over and over. I said, yeah, I know, Barb. <laughs> I said, I understand what you're saying. So she knows, but she doesn't know it's her. <laughs> Glenn, did you think it would be <laughs> nice if there were more opportunities for people with brain injuries to, you know, get a, out and be with people um, who are experiencing the same issues, or even just with other people, just to help society understand what's going on here? Uh, the unfortunate part what, that it seems like with a lot of uh, people with brain injuries is social anxiety. So. I don't know that, and I mean they're isolated, and and it's horrible, and and you want them to be out there, um, but then you have to weigh whether the anxiety that they're going through in their pre going out and the going out, if it outweighs, if it's worth, you know what they're out there getting, if it's worth the anxiety, and a lot, most times it's not. I mean whether it's sensory issues. Um, of just too much stimulation and not being able to handle that. So it, it's a nice dream, but uh, reality, probably not uh, Probably so not very realistic. You don't see it so much as a shortage of um, options. It's just that it doesn't necessarily work for everyone. Well, there's definitely a shortage of, of options. Uh, my son is now on a waiting list for a group home, and we've been on it since May, June of last year, and probably st still looking at some time before that happens. So, I mean, there's there's definitely a shortage of resources uh, there, and also, I mean, when you have somebody that's so dependent on you, to um, first of all convince them that this other person or people are going to do okay in looking after them. There's that issue there. There's also the issue of trust you trusting 
somebody else to look after your loved one. That's huge, really huge. So it's, um, education is, is paramount. Uh, most often you're, we're dealing with an invisible disability. There's no limp, you know, there's no uh, missing arm. Uh, it takes quite a long time with, for people to spend with, with my son to understand his limitations. My, probably my best revenge was he was spending a month at my mother's on suicide watch one time. And about two weeks in, I started getting phone calls from her. He's following me around like a little puppy. No, you don't say. He only does the dishes that are in the sink. He doesn't grab anything. No, really? You know, she was finally seeing something that I dealt with on a daily basis. And it was really, honestly, it was really sweet. <laughs> I did a lot of, yes. <laughs> you know. Yeah, awareness is key for you. Huge, yeah. You'd really like, you know, more people to really walk in your shoes. Yeah. Because that's the only way to feel it. It is. Fully. Yeah. Yeah. Teresa, this, uh, we talked about um, before the webcast, just how this is a lifelong situation. It's not like um, a broken leg and it's going to heal. How do you approach that um, with caregivers, knowing that this is for the rest of their lives? I think I, I really go back to the self-care. That, you know, it's like a marathon. Um, you can't sprint a marathon and think you're going to make it to the end. You have to pace yourself. You have to understand your own limitations and your own, your own levels of energy and coping. Um, you have to do a lot in order to cope. And that includes education, it includes support. You have to accept that you're not superhuman. And, you know, as Glenna says, her son is totally dependent on her, but it's cutting to a point where her own health is starting to impede. So I say to caregivers, and caregivers in general, due to, you know, according to the stats, have a shorter lifespan than the average population. It's because we want to get out of it. <laughs> Sorry. Not only because they want to get out of it. It's key, right? It's very key to coping. But, you know, I say make sure you get your annual physical, make sure you see your doctor. Um, if you think you're depressed and it's lasting more than two weeks, go talk to your family physician. So, so taking care of themselves, um, understanding that what they're dealing with is pretty overwhelming and that you're never going to be doing it 100% and that's okay. Um, none of us ever are 100%. I think these webcasts really help because they are getting the message out to the general population. Anyone who sees this, be it a caregiver, um, be it just, just your average person on the street, is going to have a greater awareness of what, what is happening with brain injury, what is happening to those caregivers. And so I think anytime we can bring things into the forefront, kind of focus the lens, no pun intended, on the issues that they're facing, I think that helps. All right, we'd like to bring in members of our audience. They have some questions, so we'll hand it over to Paige. Sure, the first question we have is from someone who has just recently sort of found themselves in the position of a caregiver and um, are feeling a little bit overwhelmed. What sort of advice do you have for someone who's just starting out um, on this task, in this role? Joe, do you want to start? I guess. Uh, you need to have patience, you need to talk to somebody, yourself, to try to understand what's going on with your loved one. That's the important thing to understand because if you don't understand you can't get help at all. So that's what this person should try and do, I think. Your wife was really in the big scheme of things just recently injured it's been yeah. five years yeah. right yeah. can you recall back to when she suffered her aneurysm and how you did um react and cope with it oh yeah when the first year i um well for the first when i brought her home 
for the first couple of months, I was just paranoid that something was going to go wrong. I was scared to go to work. Uh, I told her she wasn't allowed to touch the stove. She wasn't allowed to turn on the tub to have a bath, just in case. There's a lot of things I kind of tried to tell her that she couldn't do, because if she puts on the stove and burns herself, or she would run that water in for the tub and let it overflow, because she had no memory whatsoever. She couldn't, you know. I mean, for instance, we sold our house because she felt so uncomfortable in our house. She went for a walk down the street, turned the corner, she phoned me, she was lost. So after a year and a half of this, we drove around, we sold our house, and we took a high, we moved into a high rise where she was more comfortable because we lived there before. And she made her own route to the pharmacy so she can get her meds, and the doctor's office was close together. So that, that helped her. Uh, but myself, I was worried 24 hours a day. Like, it was hard to sleep because I didn't want to sleep in case <laughs> It happened again because when it happened, I was downstairs in my basement. I found her on my floor. So, of course, I blamed myself because I didn't get there in time. So, you, you worry about that person and you can't help it and you worry about them for a while until you can, are comfortable. I used phone her from work like five, six times a day. I, I actually phone her just to make sure she's okay. You know, and then after two years, the doctor told her she had another aneurysm, so now she takes her rings off every night before going to bed. She still does it in case because she doesn't want her rings to be cut again. So she still has that in her head that she, she's going to have another one, you know, and so you worry about that. But those first couple of years, it, 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 it was difficult. It was really, now it's a little bit better, but those first couple of years, you don't stop worrying. You never stop worrying and you're constantly phoning to make sure everything's okay. And it's like an adventure, so to speak. It's like you're married, a new woman's home in your house because it's not the same person you married when they come home at all. So you, you're getting used to this stuff. You, it's like you're in a new marriage, like you're on your honeymoon, so to speak, because everything's great because you're looking after her and she's, she's uh, liking what's going on because she's getting the full attention, so to speak, you know. So, yeah, the first couple of years, get knowledge on what she's going through or he's going through and just try and understand because if you like I said if you don't understand you can't help nothing you need to understand and that's why I started going to the group I got worried because after two years she started getting angry like her anger just went crazy so the lady at work gave me this number and I called and Teresa got me in and I went started going to care and it's 100% I'm sure it I don't know if it saved my marriage, but it saved my sanity. I'm telling you, it's, it's amazing what this group can do for you. So. Our next question is, <coughs> is there funding available for a family member to be a full-time caregiver and quit their job so their loved one doesn't have to uh, live in a facility after injury if the survivor is not safe to be home alone and needs someone to be there at all times? Is there any funding Teresa? available? Um, no, as far as I know, there's no funding. There's no funding available for a caregiver to quit their job, as far as I know. There's something called self-managed care that you can access through home care access. Um, and I know a caregiver who fought, and her husband had a very severe brain injury and also lost about 95% of his vision. Um, she were, had worked outside the home. They had little kids. And she fought and fought and got quite a good amount of funding. And so with self-managed care, the person then um, finds caregivers that they then pay to come in and look after their loved one. I don't think very often people get a lot of funding, however. That was a very rare instance. But that's not also an area that I work in, my service coordination team at work would know more about that, but as far as I know, there's no actual funding. Our next question um, is actually about um, an FASD 10-year-old, uh, but relates to caregiving as well. The question is, do you think my FASD 10-year-old acts out only with me when she is frustrated and doesn't understand something because there is that level of comfort and attachment with me as her primary caregiver? Uh, should I be ignoring the behavior, or is there something else that I can be doing? Teresa, are you able to speak to that? Yeah. Um, I don't work at all with um, children. I don't work at all with um, FASD. 
But I would say, because I do see this with, with my caregivers, with um, loved ones with brain injury, um, that, there, that there is very often, um, well, even little children who tantrum, they generally do it more with the parent that they feel safe with and secure with. Um, so, so yes, there is that level of attachment and security that involves that. Can you ignore the behavior? No. That behavior is a form of communication. That person isn't able to tell you what they need. And so um, if you can somehow get in to see a behavioral specialist, there's an FASD association. Um, I would try them, try your family doctor, but definitely you want to find out what's driving that behavior because those behaviors aren't simply whims. They are trying to communicate something. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. And our last question today is, um, first of all, they're just saying thank you to everyone for coming out and you've really sort of impacted how they, how they feel on their caregiving journey. And um, they had a question from a friend with how they can, how, how can people best support their friends that are, are caregivers? What would you like to see out of a friend or a loved one uh, to support you guys on your journey? Ellie, why don't you answer that? Lots of hugs. <sighs> Yeah, lots of hugs and just plain understanding, you know. I need to be believed. Joe, do you have anything to add? Yeah, like she said, a lot of hugs, that's for sure. Um, a lot of visits if they want, because it can be awful lonely sitting up alone watching TV for four or five hours a night, seven days a week. It was a nice visit, it would do great. Just uh, support. Support your the person that won't need it. Just support them. That's about it, I guess. All right. Could I ask something? Of course, Teresa. Go ahead. Um, Brain Care Center um, is situated in Edmonton for those who you know are other places, but we offer what's called Brain Basics, and it's an evening of education, um, and we encourage caregivers, uh, family members, close friends to come. It's about an hour and a half to two hours, and it's just, it's, I call it Intro to Brain Injury 101. So if you can find a way where you can, where you can get some education. There's also um, on probably Alberta Human Services website, uh, the Brain Injury Survival Guide. And I think you can actually go to braincarecenter.com, and we have a link to the survival guide, which is, was put out, I think, in the... 90s originally and they've reissued it and it's just a it gives very basic basic information but very very helpful and and as Ellie said understanding if you can understand what that person's going through and definitely you know that social isolation call someone up you know invite them to lunch take a picnic go sit in their backyard and chat but definitely try and keep that connection open because they really need, they really need that personal connection. All right, well a big thank you to our guests, Teresa, Joe, Glenna and Ellie for generously sharing your time and your experience with us today. And to all of you who turned into this session, we're grateful that you've spent the hour with us and that we hope that you found the conversation informative and helpful. As we mentioned in the opening, this webcast is part of the Government of Alberta's Human Services Learning Series, which will be running around the same time each month through to June of 2017. This series covers topics from Alberta Brain Injury Initiative, like the one you saw today, but also has series developed by the Employment First Initiative, Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, and the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee. To get updates and registration information about each of these sessions, please email us at abii at gov.ab.ca and ask to be added to our mailing list. As mentioned, today's webcast was recorded and the video will be posted online along with uh, videos from all the previous webcasts. The video link will be sent out to all registrants in the near future. And we encourage you to share this video with anyone you think may be interested.
And of course, if you have any feedback about today's webcast, please email us at abii at gov.ab.ca and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon and we hope to see you again next month.